there. The ver one of the very earliest of so-called water tube boilers is the Barlow boiler, where you have an internally fired boiler. This is all a boiler shell out here, and you can't really see it too well, but this is all water in between the outer and inner shell of the boiler. Build a fire inside the structure, and then you have, in this case, just horizontal tubes sitting over the top of that fire. Whole bunch more heat transfer area, certainly. Um, the tubes themselves help resist the tendency of the boiler to, to explode or, or expand. Um, you, in particular, I think the gain is in the, in the heat transfer area here. Uh, a small diameter tube, if you had steel, which you didn't have in this area, is a much easier thing to construct and, and build in mass as compared to all these other structures that you have in, in the Lancashire style boilers. But the first water tube boiler, so uh, late 1700s, um, based on what you know right now, horizontal tubes, what, what's wrong with horizontal tubes? Convection. Convection. Yeah. There's not, not a good opportunity for con natural convection of, of the water that's, that's in those tubes horizontal. If you tip them a little bit, boy, you're, you're, you start to, to gain a lot of advantage. Uh, from the drawing, you got two views. Is that a round shell, or is it square? Uh, it, it would appear it's square, although I can't say for sure. But yeah, you, I, you know, that, that same, same question comes to my, my mind as well. Well, if it's, in, if it's housing tubes inside, then it's a little... Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably, a, these two are all the same length, it's square. And in fact, in one or two slides up, you'll see that we have a boiler on site here that's, that's not too much different from this boiler, uh, the Westinghouse boiler. So, right idea of putting tubes in uh, with a little bit more thought and challenges of construction, if you could tip those tubes on an angle, you'd have a much better chance to get, get that natural circulation in the boiler that's very desirable. Um, another, uh, a little bit, a few years later, not that much later, another attempt at using tubes. What's, what's the problem with these tubes? Here you're building the fire over here, fire circulates here, smokestacks over here. Uh, what's the problem with these tubes that just have a cap on the end? They're dead headed. You're gonna collect all your crap in there. Yeah, all the crap collects in there. There's no opportunity for circulation. Yeah, you've got a lot of surface area there and that, that's a good idea, but it, it wouldn't take very many hours or days of operation before the ends of these tubes would be all filled with sediment. There's no way to clean them out, and they'd burn out. They'd, they'd overheat and burn out. So, uh, you know, kind of the right attempt at, at, at things, but but still, uh, you know, a little bit more experience and, uh, uh, is needed to, to perfect the design. Uh, specifically, here we are, we are using wrought iron. Um, you know, and wrought iron, you know, is, is becoming much more commercially available by this, this time. Finally, uh, in the U.S., we go back to the U.S., you get the, the gentleman by the name of Wilcox uh, did the right thing with putting the water tubes at an angle so you can start to get some natural circulation and convection in the boiler. He's got a curve in that tube also that allows for expansion contraction. Exactly, yeah. Um, and a curve, if that's, it, by this era, yeah, you just you might have they might be steel, but it, it, they probably still are wrought iron. Uh, it, it, it's it's not the best material, but it's the material you had at hand for it. Uh, this whole Wilcox uh, style boiler evolved over the years. And in fact, those books I have over here are um, uh, about 90 years of evolution for the Babcock and Wilcox company that has that Wilcox started and is in business to this day. Um, Babcock and Wilcox uh, uh, certainly was big in creating boilers, both marine and stationary, continue to uh, be, uh, have, have some presence in the nuclear power industry. They have the infamous relationship, they built the uh, steam power system for the Three Mile Island uh, plant that many of you are familiar with. But Babcock and Wilcox had its origins back here in the mid-1800s and still in business today. They, they still make, uh, I think, boilers for, for marine vessels and the like and, and other industrial applications. So. 
big, big transition right here in terms of putting the right things together in terms of circulation and design. I promised you earlier that I was going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, what would probably be the most classic cross-section of a, a Babcock and Wilcock boiler. You have, in this case, straight tubes at an angle. Here's the fire. The gases, we, with, bap, with the use of baffles, are forced to go by the tubes a total of three times before they go up the smokestack. Have a nice little device down here called a mud drum so that when you create sediment and precipitates from your, your boiling, you have a way of getting rid of them and blowing them off. And so that mud drum, brilliant concept. And then you have a steam drum up here with, with a, a, a natural <coughs> convection loop associated with it. And in the steam drum, you have a chance for the, the liquid and the, and the gas, the steam to separate. And by the time you're drawing steam off from the top of here, you have a much better opportunity for that steam to be dry and higher quality. Were they using a traveling grate by then? A what? A traveling grate? No, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. Um, in, in a large, large stationary application, you, you, you might have that, the, the moving grate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What he's talking about is, is building a, your fire not on a fixed grate, but basically a, a chain or a, 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 a mesh chain Thing so that you, you start the fire on one end, it burns and burns and burns, and by, by the time it gets to the back of the firebox, it's completely burned off and you dump the ash off of it. Uh, I went to school at WSU and the heating boilers in as recently as the 70s used a moving grate, grate mm -hmm. system on the coal. How does the mud drum work? Mud drum works. Okay, so when you boil the water and, and evaporate the water, the minerals stay behind. And some of them will cling to the walls of the heating surfaces. Others will remain as discrete particles in, in the liquid. And they will settle out at the low point in the boiler. And in fact, the cool water is, is, is circulating back here. So this is going to be the coolest part of the boiler here. And so it just gives it a, a place to collect. And periodically, you know, once a shift, once probably every few hours, depending upon the quality of the water, you would open a valve and let a big, fast, rapid stream of water come screeching out of the boiler, and that would drag out the sediment and, uh, and precipitates. And indeed, in our boilers, it's, it's a process called blowing down of the boiler. You, you do that. This particular style of boiler, you're, you're, it's going to be quite effective. On a locomotive style of boiler like we use, and Bob will, will, will narrate, yeah, it, 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 it does a little bit. Uh, it, it, it helps. You, you don't have enough good circulation. but. This is the lowest point in the boiler, and it's also the coldest point in the boiler, so that's, that's where you're going get, to get most of your, your suspended stuff in your nose. Is it called a mud box? Mud, mud drum mud is, drum is, is, is the... Drum. Yeah. Uh, oh, the other thing about this, getting back to how do you clean sediment on the water side of boilers. The other thing about this design that's real neat, each one of these little things here is a handhold so that you can open up each and every one of these tubes and be able to, to, on the water side of the tube, scrape it out, brush it out. And so, yeah, it's a lot of work in life, but at least without popping rivets and tearing the boiler apart, you have access to most of the heat transfer surface of this boiler. And so this is a neat, neat boiler uh, and a, kind of a, a milestone, if you will. And all modern utility boilers are kind of evolved from this point forward. Okay, moving on quicker. Um, we do have an example, one example on site here of a water tube boiler. It, it is the Westinghouse style boiler, uh, original design of which came up uh, in the late 1800s. Our example is what, 1912? Is that, am I remembering right, Gary? 1906, I think. Six, okay. Early 1900s. It is very similar to that, uh, what was it, was it the Barlow boiler? Or no, it was the, uh, yeah. Barlow boiler, in that it has horizontal tubes. It has this outer shell that goes up over the structure here and rivets, is held on actually by bolts around uh, this ceiling ring. Uh, a total of five or six horizontal arrays of tubes, some going this way, some going this way, uh, constitute oh, the majority of the heat transfer area. 
this is um, this part of the, the firebox is uh, two thicknesses, so you have water surrounding the fire and then the smokestack. And I kind of cut my teeth uh, for about 10 or 15 years on this Westinghouse traction engine. Uh, wonderful piece of machinery. You know, you're from Collier. Do you still have your Westinghouse there? Yes, we hope to bring up steam up this year. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Uh, there's not very many of those around. There, there, there are a handful, one of which is in the Smithsonian Museum, and I think we probably have the only two operational ones on the West Coast. I think there's four. On the West Coast? Or um, or operational. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The, what, uh, one of our more rare machines are around. Uh, it does represent a, a pretty good idea in terms of use of water tube uh, construction. It still has that deficiency of those tubes are horizontal. They're not, not sloped. And, and for obvious reasons, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's much harder to fabricate, at least in the confines of a, a fairly small, mobile boiler. Getting the slope in those tubes is, is more difficult. But yeah, if you have a chance, uh, take a close look at the Westinghouse's, hopefully, mm -hmm. two of them on site when they're here, because they, they are a very unique traction engine. Because that boiler is on a moving vehicle, it's bouncing around. The horizontal is not such an issue because they're yeah. sloshing things around and, and helping. From a sediment point of view, yeah, things are, mo are moving around. Um, as I started to say, I spent a lot of time on the Western House. It fires real quick, relatively speaking, to, to compared to a locomotive-style boiler. The total amount of water in this boiler for the given amount of surface area on it is, is much smaller than, than a comparable size locomotive boiler, so it fires quick. It, it follows the load real quick. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a good boiler in, in, in that regard. Uh, you, you, I don't know, don't know for sure the history of when, you may you know when Westinghouse stopped producing those, but uh, you know, it wasn't, a, you know, the locomotive style boiler continued onward in traction engines for at least a decade or two after, after Westinghouse, I think. We don't, we don't see many, many Westinghouses from the in, in England, Merriweather built little fire engines with that same type of boiler, yes. and they made a bunch of them during World War II to help put the fires out oh. during the Blitz. Blitz, wow. Um, yeah, I didn't realize one on every street corner. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, um, okay. We're, we're pushing our way further forward. Here's a, a Sterling, which Sterling Boyle Company, although it was bought out or merged with Babcock and Wilcox, they kind of took a, a further extension of the notion of a, a water tube boiler with a mud drum, steam drums, and then let's see, the fire is built here in this grate, and the fire, the products of combustion will take a total of three passes by those tubes. This would be uh, for a, probably a large stationary power plant application. This is definitely a power boiler. By this time, you're, you're probably talking uh, a few hundred PSI operating temperature. I've taken a guess at that, but this style boiler was uh, maybe in the one to two or one to 300 PSI operating range. Quite efficient. Uh, definitely, as you guess here, it looks an awful lot like that little YouTube experimental thing with the Bunsen burner sitting here for getting real good circulation, real good opportunity to blow out sediments and the like. These tubes are, are not as accessible as the earlier versions of the uh, uh, Wilcox or Babcock and Wilcox boilers, but still, uh, again, near the turn of the last century. Sterling stayed, stayed in existence, and I, they, they have comparable books to what I have on the Babcock and Wilcox until, I don't know, I think they merged in the early part of the 19th century. Okay, so now we're going to jump forward to losing the overhead. Where did it go? Thank you. Uh, we're going to jump forward and take a look at a boiler from the 70s, but it could easily be a boiler from right now in terms of utility scale boilers. They just get bigger <laughs> and higher temperature. Babcock and Wilcox. This is a picture out of the big red book, or actually the, the blue book that's, that's sitting on there. This is representative of a boiler that was uh, is being used for coal-fired power plants, predominantly in the southwest, 
Midwest and eastern part of the United States. You, get, you have th two, three coal power, power plants in the Northwest, and they, they, they would have boilers along these lines. But uh, the, the thing to, think to start to appreciate here is these boilers are big. They're huge. Here's, here's for scale, a person, in this case, Gary Clark, standing alongside the boiler. So this, is, this is a boiler that stands maybe 10 or 15 stories tall. You're making these huge, huge fires in them. Um, and you're just moving a lot of energy around. And here's my, my factory uh, sheet on that. Um, so modern power boiler. A boiler, uh, not this particular boiler, a boiler along these lines can operate up to 3,500 PSI. So, you know, for those of you that do oxyacetylene welding, that's, that's well above the pressure of a full oxygen cylinder. It's huge amount of pressures. And they are operating at temperatures on the order of uh, 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, and even higher in other instances. Which, for those of you that heat and beat metal, metal at that temperature is starting to glow a dull red. So the steam surfaces and, and you know, steam lines coming out, they're glowing a dull red at the operating temperatures that these are on. And most of us think, oh boy, metal's pretty soft at that temperature, isn't it? You can really hammer and bend it really. Well, that's the big problem is that you start to run out of, of useful strength of your materials at, at those temperatures. So it's this continual trade-off of, hey, I'd like to run it at a higher temperature because that means more efficiency, uh, more, econ more economical boiler. But then if I come under metal, into material shortcomings. And, and boilers like this, you don't design to you know, run for two or three years. You design them with a 40 year or more useful life. So you, you have, to, have to make them very robust. But yeah, it just blows my mind away that these kind of boilers operate at kind of a dull red operating temperature. The steam going into the turbine, if you could peel off the insulation on the pipes, those pipes would be glowing a dull red. They're also about three inches thick. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, and in terms of the amount of steam, you know, we, we think of our boilers around here, you know, work, work in a traction boiler, what, a few hundred gallons of water an hour? A couple, three hundred maybe-ish. These boilers um, could be something of this scale, maybe a little bit larger, can be putting through on the order of a million gallons of water an hour, evaporating a million gallons of water an hour. That seems a lot until you start to think of it. Okay, that's 16,000 gallons of water a minute in the boiler. It's this huge amount of water going through, and of course it just takes huge feed pumps and the like to push that water into the boiler. But it's just a scale that just, you know, my head explodes at, at that point when I think about how big these utility scale boilers are. Um, the examples of, those of this scale boiler in, in our region, the Boardman coal plant uh, out in north central Oregon, uh, going to be shut down here in two or three years. Uh, coal-fired plant, pretty good size. Uh, there's two units up at Centralia, coal-fired units, also going to be shut down here in the next two or three years. And then uh, Coal Strip, Montana. There's uh, four, or four or six units, so several coal-fired units that are of this scale, electric utility scale boilers that um, are just incredible in terms of size. Um, and you know, getting into a little bit of you know, modern energy discussion here. The U.S. has probably put into operation its very last coal-powered electric plant here um, a few years ago, uh, which was in Fulton, Arkansas, the John W. Turk plant. It uh, actually operates it's a little bit bigger. It, it's, it's, it's running um, at a higher temperature and a higher efficiency, uh, it went into operation about three or four years ago. And it, uh, probably the end of the line is in terms of coal-fired power plants for the US. It, it's, it's a very efficient plant, but not nearly as efficient as other, other variants of power plants. And as, if, if you follow the, in the energy industry, several big scale power plants like this a year are being shut down side for environmental reasons and probably even more so economic reasons. Uh, natural gas is just eating 
eating the, the, the coal as a fuel business. You can, can make a, a plant out of a natural gas system much more efficient. And uh, on the wall here, I hung up a couple of posters. The one behind this gentleman right here is an example of the kind of the state of the art esteem. And I'll just briefly make some hand waving emotions about it. No longer are, with the exception of, of China and India, you're not producing these, these power plants that just start out with coal, burn it in a boiler, create steam, and, and turn a turbine with it. The real state of the art of steam engineering is you take a combustion turbine, you take a jet engine, and it's, it's, it's not much more than that. It's a scaled version of the jet, of, the, of an engine you find on an aircraft. You burn natural gas in it, and these, these combustion turbines are better part the, of the size of this room in scope. Huge, huge combustion turbines. And you generate about two thirds of your electricity with that, the shaft coming off from that combustion turbine. And then you take the exhaust, the very hot exhaust coming off from that combustion turbine, run it through a steam boiler, create steam, and in most cases have a separate steam turbine. So you ha have two turbines, it's, it's what's called a combined cycle gas turbine plant where you're combining the, the combustion turbine and the steam turbine. And you have generators on both of those shafts. In some cases you have one common shaft that's both combustion and steam, but that's kind of rare. That's the state of the art of electric power generation right now. And whereas a plant like this, at its very best, is only about 38 to 40% efficient. A combined cycle plant like that, they're pushing 65% efficient. So you can get much more efficiency with a fuel that arguably is much more environmentally uh, benign. It's not really benign, it's still, it's still a fossil fuel. But uh, these very elaborate power plants, and take, you can take a look at this, it kind of shows a cross section of both the combustion turbine and the, the steam boiler there. So. Steam's still alive, steam is still keeping the lights on, and in fact, on a, a bad water year for us in the Northwest, natural gas is producing about as much electricity as, as um, hydropower. On a good water year, they, they, you, you still can't beat hydropower for, for inexpensive power. And, and it, uh, the, the corresponding to the amount of natural gas produced power is, is next to us. Anyway, old versus new. And, and the new still is exciting and just amazing. And still. Okay, jumping back to vintage. We were talking at the break about um, a, a given boiler uh, that these folks, I'm sorry, did catch his name? Ajax. 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 Had, had seen in a warehouse or industrial facility, I'm guessing it's along the lines of, of this, this style boiler, which is a horizontal return tubular boiler. You ha and, and this is a, a design that uh, to this day you find in heating applications or, or close variants of this in heating applications, low, low pressure, but it also is, is the design, of, uh, more or less the design of boiler that we had running our sawmill here up until about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. When, when, when did we do away with the old Johnson Brothers boiler on the sawmill? 10 years ago, I Yeah, yeah, so. This mid 1800s? This, is, this would be mid 1800s, uh, latter part of 1800s, up to almost present day. Mm -hmm. Pretty, it, from a design point of view and fabrication point of view, it's, it's fairly simple. You have a, a cylinder, a shell, an outer cell, a shell, and you're building, it's externally fired, you're building the fire here, the products of combustion pass along the outside of the shell, and then go through a very large number of water or fire tubes? Fire, fire tubes. tubes. Fire tubes, yes. And then up the smokestack. And you can see a working commercial example of this boiler design that is vintage about, uh, 50 miles from here down at the Hull and Oak Sawmill, which is the one of the last steam-powered sawmills you're going to get. It's, in, it's near Monroe, okay. Oregon. Uh, they are, it, it's a family-run business that is still using a steam engine on the head saw. Uh, and they have two rather large uh, HRT, horizontal return tube boilers, that date back to, I'm guessing, they're, I think around the 1910, 1920, 
that vintage. Um, they, they run the boilers with the sawdust from the mill. It's kind of a, it's a use, their, their fuel is the sawdust that comes off from the mill and the shavings come off the planer mill. Neat facility. The other parts of the mill are, are, are you know, quasi-modern uh, sawmill practice, but they still, the head saw, head saw still is, can be run off from a steam engine. They have the option of putting it, in, putting it on as the electric motor. But it is, it is the, the Taj Mahal, if you will, of steam in the mid Willamette Valley. And, and if you have a chance to get down there, um, call ahead. My experience has been that they, 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 they will take you through the mill. Don? As, as a point, uh, within about the last year, they no longer run that head saw on, on steam. Oh, they don't? They, oh. they finally just succumb to the, the logistics of oh, no. it going. They are keeping everything intact, and they will still fire up the boilers and run for school tours or special occasions. But it used to be that you could drop in there any day and see yeah. them run on steam. I'm sorry to hear that. Long they were in about the last year. Huh. But they, they don't run day to day on steam, but they have everything still in place and they are maintaining everything still in place so that they can yeah. fire up and run on steam. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. What was the name again? It's Hull Oaks Sawmill. And they found a little niche marketplace because of this vintage head saw they have. They do big dimensional timber. They can do a well, if you around the Corvallis area, they do park bench <laughs> examples. What they can do, they can do a a park bench that is uh, five feet across by eight inches thick by eighty five feet long. Wow. One, you know, if, you, if you can find a log that big, wow. they, they they do large dimensional timber, and as, as they, they 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 by no means are competitive with the Seneca sawmills of the world, but but they have found this this niche market that until recently was steam powered. Uh, that uh, in the large dimensional timber. And, and it's family owned, uh, many, about a third or fourth generation wow. of the family. They, they also own the timber lanes in the area. Anyway, cool. HRTs. Um, moving on quicker, Scotch boiler. Um, this is, a, if you take a look at it, it's similar to the, the HRT, except that it's an internally fired boiler. Here's, this is the, where you put the furnace or the fire here. Um, products of combustion would flow along into this, this what I think they would they'd be called the combustion chamber, and then out through tubes and up the smokestack. Um, variations of this boiler uh, were found in, in most marine applications up through the first three, three up through the 1930s in uh, marine practice. The, my, my lead slide that's on the cover of your, your you do have a different handout. My lead slide started out with an example of this. At least one of you recognized where this picture came from. And it's even better when it's front ways. <laughs> These are the boilers out of the Titanic before they were installed in the Titanic. And they're a, a Scotch style marine boiler. Um, and, okay, so factoid, go back to factoid times. Um, the Titanic, and if you want to study one steam power system, spend half an hour reading about the, the engine room and the boiler room of the Titanic. Uh, 29 of these boilers, it took a, a crew of about 180 stokers and trimmers to feed fuel into this system. What's wrong with that if you've got, if you have to have 180 people on board just to feed fuel into the boiler? <laughs> you've got to pay every one of those guys. You've got to feed every one of those guys. Put everyone in bunks. So you're, you're, you're in the business of taking passengers across the Atlantic, and you, you, just, just to feed the boilers on, you've got 180 people. This is coal, obviously. A um, little factoid, I have two cousins that went down with the Titanic. One was a stoker and one was a trimmer. Very distant. distant. It's, 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 in, in name only, I have a tie to the Titanic. But, 20, 29 of these huge boilers, and let's see, you can see this is a person standing here, but the uh, boilers are six, more or less 16 feet in diameter. Um, they uh, under, underway, they burn about 600 tons of coal a day, 
and all that coal had to be handled probably two or three times before it actually got in the furnace. Just hugely labor intensive. But, and, and the, so the, the boiler room and boiler rooms of the tank were fascinating, but the engine rooms were even more fascinating. This was right in the era when most ships were powered by huge, massive, huge, bigger than this room, reciprocating steam engines. But turbines were, were just coming along. And the engineers that designed the Titanic used both of those technologies in the propulsion of it. it, it the steam came out at, um, let's see here, it was it's about 200 PSI. Uh, yeah, 210 PSI went into the reciprocating engine, triple expansion, came out of the reciprocating engine at 9 PSI, went through a huge turbine, and then went to the condensers. So it was this fascinating power plant system, all of which was used for a half of one commercial paying trip. <laughs> ended up on the bottom of the Atlantic. But, uh, there, there, there were sister ships. Uh, and if you read about the Mauritania and the Olympic and all the ships of that era, just real good stuff to read. So just a quick thing. The Titanic movie that came out 10 or 15 years ago, uh, they have the scenes in the engine room. Uh, that engine is in the Jeremiah O'Brien, which is a livery ship that was built for World War II. And they took all the ladders and the crap out of the way so they could get a photograph. And then they digitally did a mirror image of it to get the two engines for the engine room shot. Yeah, to San Francisco is worth the vacation to tour the Jeremiah O'Brien when, it when it's fired up. It is yeah. really yeah. something. And you climb around the whole thing, and yeah. you're right down there with it, feeling the heat. And yeah, what these folks are referring to, if you're not familiar, Liberty Ships were probably the last mass-produced, reciprocating, steam-powered vessel. And they were made by the Bazillion during World War II. Hundreds, if not thousands, I don't know the exact number. And some of them were made right up here on the uh, Columbia River by Kaiser. A, a large number of them were made and a bunch there, in the Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. And reciprocating steam engines, probably scotch boilers. Uh, and yeah, that Titanic movie did a pretty darn good job of their representation of the engine room environments. It was a hellacious environment. It was like 120 degrees Fahrenheit there, 110, 120. No exaggeration. That's what these guys were doing when they were stoking coal in that environment. Anyway, moving on. Let's go back to more modest scope steam boilers like we might find around here. Um, there are other fire tube boilers that were real common in uh, both stationary and semi-mobile applications. Uh, steam donkey engines out in the woods, in, in our case, uh, that use a vertical fire tube boiler. Uh, where let's start over here. You have a firebox. It's internally fired. It's a the, the, the fire is surrounded on all sides except the bottom with water. And you uh, in, in the for a, a donkey engine application, you would be burning wood uh, in a uh, marine application, or in, in our case, a railway application. You'd be burning burning coal or oil. Um, the Bucyrus series steam crane out here has a boiler very similar to this in design, bigger, more tubes and the like, but it's the same concept. <laughs> Firebox here, the heat of combustion flows upward in a vertical way, as one might guess, uh, through these fire tubes, which are surrounded by a cylinder that is holding water. Um, pretty straightforward and inexpensive to manufacture. Um, Riveted construction until till recently. Um, the there are two different variants of it. This is by far and away the more common variant, which would be called a dry top vertical, where there's a part of the tubes that are not surrounded by water, and that can be a little bit of a problem if you're stoking real heavy and those tubes get too hot, or you don't have good circulation there. That there's a tendency for the tubes to be uh, challenged, if you will, on the hot hot top of the boiler here. So the way they address that is what we call the submerged tube boiler, where they add a, another kind of funnel-shaped section here. Top of the tubes are underneath, submerged in water. As you might guess, more elaborate construction. I think there were a whole lot more of these around than this, but I don't, don't 
don't have the exact numbers on it. But vertical fire tube boiler, real common. Um, steam dredges, uh, a lot of hoists that you see, derricks and the like. Um, pile drivers, this type of boiler. In, in, in more modern times, oil fired more often than not. So if you want to see a, a vertical boiler in operation, you have the Fusera series, and then uh, how many other boilers, verticals we have at Showtime now? Uh, one or two, Gary? We have, do we have any other verticals? Any other vertical boilers operating now? Operating. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, a, a, a very economical or relatively economical boiler from a fabrication point of view. Uh, Willamette uh, was a big name in out in the woods, and that was produced right in Portland. So there, there's a lo local manufacturer of boilers uh, of this this type. Historically, that is. Is that Willamette I always give? Yeah. My dad worked there. So I don't like really? Really? What do you do? Yeah, well, Lambert produced steam donkey engines and the like, but they also produced the gear the locomotives. And you know, big Port Portland actually was a pretty pretty good place to be if you're interested in steam engineering. Uh, in addition to the foundries and the like there. Tri Scalian pump as well. Okay, any questions? We're just about finishing up here uh, with this segment, and then we'll get you outside, get you out in the cold area. You can wake up and. Uh, be regenerated. Then we'll come back for, I'll try and limit it to, we'll get you out of here by noon, maybe a little bit before then. Is that okay with everyone? Did you, are you anticipating being around for that time? Okay. Um, we're finally going to close in terms of our, our 250 years of boiler design with the locomotive style boiler, which um, is safe to say is probably the most common boiler uh, you'll find in vintage equipment from you know the last century, century and a half. As its name implies, it's, it's used almost ex it, it, for railway locomotives. It was almost exclusively the only boiler design, and I think I'm safe to say that. Uh, the way the, the gist of the boiler, and I think, yeah, we'll let's do these pictures. I'll, I'll, I'll explain by some vague hand waving here, but Bob will do a much better job outside. You have a um, a boiler that consists of a firebox assembly here, uh, and then a cylindrical tube that are, are joined together. The firebox um, in cross section, you've got the grates on top of which you'd be building your fire, and the uh, firebox proper, you might have a baffle in here. And so the products of combustion will, will circulate in the firebox. It's totally surrounded by water. In some cases, it's truly 100% surrounded by water, which would be called a wet bottom uh, or water bottom stationary uh, locomotive style. Or if you have uh, brick in an in a, a ash pit there that, that's out, out of masonry, it's called dry bottom. So all the radiation, virtually all the radiation from, from the fire is captured by water. And then the uh, products of combustion flow are directed through these long fire tubes and ultimately to the smoke box and up the stack. Um, from a ease of construction, ease of maintenance, design consideration, this kind of became, I would say, an optimal point, but it was a very popular point in terms of boiler design. There were a lot of these made. They weren't exclusively on locomotives or traction engines. There were stationary applications for these boilers as well. Uh, you could make this, the, the fire tubes themselves, very, very long. And if you wanted more heat transfer service and surface and more, more efficiency, they could become uh, 20 or more feet long uh, in a stationary application. So your water level, and Bob's going to make very important points about this, your water level is sitting right there so that this uh, firebox and, and the internal sheet, 
called the crown sheet of that power box is fully submerged. If you want to take away one little little uh, point from all of my rambling, keep keep your water level right, and in this case, keep it above the crown sheet. If you do that, you're probably not going to have a boiler explode in your face. Um, mostly solid fuel, you know, wood, coal, and as I mentioned, straw. Uh, I would guess, although I haven't actually seen it, uh, you know, if you had a, a uh, stationary application, you might be burning oil in them, but I, I've, I've never come across them in my limited samples, but mostly solid fuel. Operating pressures up to high, uh, you know, maybe approaching 200 PSI for, for uh, our, our kind of work in the, in, the, in the railroad applications, which was the most aggressive use of this boiler design, upwards of 300 PSI. In addition to these saturated steam heating surfaces, you can stuff some superheater tubes up, up in, in here, and, and the various railway locomotives had a number of different ways of doing that, and it, it adds quite a bit of complexity to the fabrication and the like, but you definitely gain efficiency and, uh, by, by superheating. I'm not going to say a whole lot more because Bob can do a much better job than I can giving you an appreciation of a locomotive style boiler when you see it out in front of you. So at this point, why don't you go out, we still need to drag them back here for the, the last 20 or 30 minutes so after you're done. Bring, bring them back here for 